So, a couple of special situations. First of all, usually we have a whole bunch of particles or a solid object that is made up of a whole bunch of particles, right? We don't have single particles, though sometimes we can assume we have single, things act like single particles. All right, so if we can lump these particles together to create a solid body, we still have the same equation, all right? Sum of forces equals mass times acceleration, but what, the acceleration of what? If you clump a whole bunch of particles together, it could be that some of those particles aren't accelerating at the same rate as other particles. So what we use is the acceleration of the center of gravity. Thinking back to statics, we found the center of gravity for various objects, right? There was a whole big process, and we'll revisit that when we get to the point where we're doing it here. M is just the sum of the masses of all the little particles, so it's, su it's the mass of the whole body together. Okay, something else that we need, that we saw in statics that we'll have to factor into dynamics as well is friction. So if we remember friction, friction always acts to oppose the motion, right? So if an object is moving to the right, friction is going to be to the left. There's two types of friction. There's kinetic friction, which is occurring when an object moves over a rough surface. So we've got a moving uh, object, which is why it's called kinetic and the surface is rough, so there's a friction. There's also static friction, which prevents an object from moving. So you've got static friction up until the point it moves, and then you've got kinetic friction after it starts moving. Static friction is, in the vast majority of cases, bigger than kinetic friction. Okay. So that's why you pull hard to get something to move, but once it's moving, it's easier to pull. That's the effect that you're feeling there. The equation for friction is the force of friction is equal to mu, where you've got a mu k or a mu s, depending on which friction you're looking at, times the normal force. So we'll be looking at an example of using friction in a second. The other thing that can create forces often or springs. So we've got elastic springs. They create a force based on how much they're stretched or compressed. So S is the change in spring length. There's nothing special about S. You could call it X. You could call it delta L. Whatever you want to call it. But that's the distance that the spring is stretched or compressed. K is the spring constant for that spring, which is usually given to you. Something to notice because of the way this is written, if you stretch a spring only a little bit, you're going to have a smaller force than if you stretch the spring a lot. That means your force isn't constant. If your force isn't constant, your acceleration is not constant either, which means you can't use the constant acceleration kinematic equations. You're going to have to use integrals or derivatives. And we'll see that in an example as well. So here's the example with the spring. So what we've got is this bobbin, or the shaft, right? The shaft is two kilograms. That's this dark blue part that they, that um, is on the inside there. There's two different springs, and the springs are attached to the two ends, to B, the support at B, and the two, the various ends. So we're going to push on end A, and we're going to compress this first spring, and elongate the second spring. All right, so initially those springs are the same length and they're unstretched. And then we apply this force and we're going to shift this blue bobbin over um, and to the point where S is 50. All right, so this is going to become 50 here. And this side is going to come out to here and be 450. All right. So let's draw a free body diagram of the blue thing, the blue spool, after we've moved it this far. So here's our blue spool. There it is. Not a very good sketch, but it'll have to do. Okay, so if we're compressing this first spring, that means 
it's going to be push. We're pushing on it to compress it, so it must be pushing on the spool. So it's going to create a force going this way. I'm going to call that F1. The second spring we're elongating, right? Because we're going from its initial length to something that's longer. So to elongate a spring, we have to pull on it. So it must be pulling on the spool. So that's going to be F2. And we also have F which is the, the force we're applying. That's our five kilonewtons. All right, so those are the forces in the horizontal direction. There are also forces in the vertical direction, right? There's a normal force at B that's supporting the spool so it doesn't fall, and there's the weight of the spool that's pushing down on that. I'm not going to draw those on there because we're only going to be interested in this direction, in the horizontal direction. So we need to pick a direction that's going to be positive. I'm going to say this way. I don't really know. It seems like we're moving that way. So I'm going to say to the left is going to be our positive direction. So if we write our force equation now in this direction for sum of forces equal to ma, the sum of the forces we've got F in the positive direction minus F1 minus F2 is equal to the mass, which is 2 kilograms, times the acceleration. All right. Now, this is a spring, so that acceleration is not a constant, right? Because F1 and F2 depend on the position, S, or X. So let's take a look, then, at the expressions for F1 and F2. They're both springs, so they're going to be a KX-type equation. So we've got K1 is 2 kilonewtons, so we're going to write 2,000, times the amount that it is compressed. So I'm going to call that X. And then F2 is going to be KX as well. The X is the same, right? This is going to be compressed. That's going to be elongated by the same amount because the length of the spool itself doesn't change. So that's going to be 3,000 times x. All right, so let's take this over here. We'll plug them in. F is a constant. That's 5,000 minus 2,000 x minus 3,000 x is equal to 2 times a. So now we have a in terms of x. Um, which is what we wanted, right? We've got the acceleration in terms of the position. We can rewrite this. A then is equal to, this is 5,000 minus 5,000 divided by 2, so we've got 2,500 minus 2,500x. All right, so back to our kinematic equations. We're still going to use the A dx is equal to V dV. Notice I'm writing x's now because that's the variable I picked. In the equation, it says s. It's just a position variable, right? x is a position variable, too. So if we do this integral, we're going to integrate this one from unstretched to the final stretched position. What is it at the final stretched position? So unstretched was 250 millimeters. Stretched is 50 for one, 450 for the other, right? So the one that got longer got longer by 200 millimeters. The one that got shorter got shorter by 200 millimeters, right? So x is going to equal s minus s naught. We can do the 450 one minus 250 is equal to 200. These are millimeters. I want it in meters, so that's going to be 0.2 meters. All right, so I'm going 0 to 0.2, and this integral is going from 0, starting at rest, to whatever speed we're solving for. All right, so we're going to integrate this. Integrate 2500 minus 2500x. We get 2500. We'll pull it out. That's x. All right, the integral of a constant becomes x minus one-half x squared. That's going to be evaluated from 0 to 0.2 is equal to one-half v squared. Plug in 0.2 for those x's. Solve for v. We're going to get a v of e equal to 30 meters per second. All right.
right, now let's look at an example that deals with friction. So we've got a man pushing a crate. He's pushing down at an angle, a 30 degree angle in fact. And we need to figure out um, how fast is this crate going to accelerate once it starts moving. So if you imagine doing this, the crate is heavy, you're pushing on it, you increase the force you're pushing until it starts moving, and then it's going to accelerate. Right, so we're dealing with static and kinetic friction here. So, first of all, let's draw a free body diagram. If this is our crate, we've got the force going down on the crate. We've got a normal force pushing up on the crate. The crate would move in this direction, so friction's going to go that way. So there's friction, there's the normal force. We've got the weight of the crate, mg, or... 60 pounds, and that's it, right? And those are all the forces, if we include the F that's already drawn for us. So notice they give us weight, not mass. So mass is going to equal 60 divided by 32.2, just to remind us. All right, let's look at our directions. We're going to need both directions now because we know the friction is equal to mu times the normal force. So we're going to need to use, let's give, we'll call that x and this y. We're going to need the y direction to find the normal force so that we can use the friction in the x direction. So let's write our equations. Well, some forces to the right being positive. So our friction is negative. And the guy is pushing the part that's going to the right is F times the cosine, the adjacent part, of 30. That's going to equal mass times the acceleration in that direction. There is no acceleration up or down, right, because it's sitting on the floor. It's not accelerating up or down. So if we say up is positive, sum of forces is equal to normal is positive, the weight is negative, and the part of F that's going down is F sine of 30, also negative. That is going to equal zero. So using that then, the normal force is equal to mg plus F sine 30. All right, so those are our Newton's second laws. That's the kinetic part of this. Now let's think about what's happening here. First, He's pushing it, he's pushing it, he's slowly increasing his force to the point right where it starts to move. That's going to happen when we overcome friction. Okay? So, part one, we have to overcome friction. Static friction. Sorry, let's write in static. We're going to overcome static friction. So in that case, F is going to equal, right as we overcome it, is going to equal the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. So, and the acceleration, because we're still, at that instant, still not moving, right? The acceleration is going to equal zero. So now we can go back to our equations, and we can write, if the acceleration is zero from this first one, we get that mu n is equal to f cosine 30, right? Because the acceleration is zero, we move things over to the other side. Um, n from the other equation is mg plus f sine 30. So if we plug everything in, mu is going to be 0 0.6, because it's static friction we're overcoming at this point mg is just the weight, so that's 60. f is something we don't know, but that's what we're trying to find at this point. Sine of 30 is equal to f cosine of 30. The only unknown in this equation is f, so we can solve for f, and we get that f is equal to 63.6 pounds. So he has to push with 63.6 pounds before this thing will move. Then right after it starts moving, right, 
So it's, we've overcome the static friction. Now it's moving with the kinetic friction. Okay, and we're trying to find the acceleration. So now the friction is going to be 0.3 times n because we're using the kinetic friction. And the acceleration is not equal to zero. In fact, that's what we're trying to solve for. So now we have mu times n negative plus f cosine 30 is equal to mass times acceleration. So if we plug things in, negative 0.3, that's a 3, times the weight, 60, plus f, we know, is 63.6, sine of 30, plus f, 63.6, cosine of 30, is equal to mass, which was 60, the weight over 32.2, times the acceleration. And the only unknown in that equation is the acceleration. To solve for the acceleration, we should get 14.8 feet per second squared.